5. Uh, it would be handy to have your, your Bibles open. We're going to refer to it a little bit. Uh, it's only six verses. You, you've heard them read. We're going to dip into them a little bit again. But let me start off by saying something, hopefully, a little bit uh, uh, bold, but, but encouraging. James is not against money. He's not against wealth. And neither was Jesus. But they are both against the misuse of money. Not having money in its rightful place. So when we read verse 1, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. At a very quick glance, you could think that that's uh, all rich people. But it's not. It's the rich people he goes on to describe. It's these rich people who, who I said, are, who, are, who have got immoral wealth. Because really I would say is that the, the title for my sermon, we're looking at immoral wealth or corrupting wealth. And James goes on to point out three different areas of immoral wealth. In verses 2 and 3 he talks about hoarders of wealth. In verses 4, he talks about unjust employers. And in verses 5 and 6, he talks about the selfish wealthy. And so this morning we're going to look at these verses and look at these three areas of wealth and see what we can learn from. So verses 2 and 3, he says this. Your wealth has rotted and moss have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. The corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. So I've called these the hoarders. So what's the story here? At the time of James' writing, the main way that people showed their wealth or contained their wealth was in very expensive clothes and in, in jewellery and, and gold. And it appears that these wealthy people had so many clothes, not even using them, spent a fortune on buying them, that they were just lying there or sat there or in boxes, rotting away. What a horrendous use of wealth. And he goes over the top. We know that gold can't rust, pure gold can't rust. But he says... That, that the gold and silver is corroded. What's he saying there? Well, he's either going over the top and to make the point, you've got so much gold that's sat there doing nothing, that's corroding. You know, it's, it's not natural. It's not natural. It's just a waste of money. It's a waste of resources. I heard somebody say just last week that it's a possession one minute and the next minute it's junk. How's that work? You know, we're going to do a car boot sale, we've got to get together all our junk. But before you're going to do a car boot sale, it was a possession. <laughs> eh? You know, and we do have to, to question that. There's a guy at our church called Dan Stiles, and he's a motto which is one in, one out. If I'm going to buy something, I'm going to get rid of something. And I know Ben, my son, has benefited from that. Dan's given him some, some fantastic stuff. So in this area, I don't want to point the finger at those massively rich people that we all hate, or most of us have some grudge against, you know. But I want us to just ask ourselves the question, how much stuff do we have that we don't need? How much are we hoarding? How much can we give to our friends? Can we give to charity? Can we give to the needy? Or perhaps an even better question is, how much do we think before we buy it in the first place? You know, do we really need it? I'm not saying don't buy stuff. I'm just saying don't go for retail therapy. You know, it's not a good way of doing it. You know, I'm not saying deprive yourself. I'm just saying ask before you buy. Simple as that. And yeah, you know, Stella loves doing this. But it means that we're really bad in the first bit. She loves saying, 
we've got to do a clear out. We've got to do a clear out. We've got to get rid of all this stuff. It's ridiculous. The trouble is, we've got to have bought it in the first place. So we've done the wrong thing in the first place. Maybe a slight rectification that we give it away afterwards. But let's just think about that. But he then goes on to on verse 4. And he says this in verse 4. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workmen, the more you feel to cry out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. So you've got an employer who's not paying his staff properly. An employer is not paying his staff properly. Have you ever heard of that before? Hey, I was preparing this and I thought, hang on a minute, that was DW last week, wasn't it? You know, I don't know if you know about DW, the big sports company, they've had an investigation and the, 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 the Sports Direct, sorry, Sports Direct. Yeah, sorry for DW if you're watching this on video. I'm sure you are paying your employers well. Sports Direct, you're right. I should look at my notes and not just start speaking to sure you. You know, and they said they're going to fix it, they're going to make sure they pay their staff the minimum wage. So generous, so generous. And we're aware of many companies that around the world that run, have run sweatshops and employ kids and basically not treated the staff ethically or even not treated the public ethically. And as Christians, we need to fight for the rights you know, of, of workers to be treated fairly and ensure that if you're in the fortunate position to own a business, that you look after your staff and be an ethical employer. You know, I find myself as someone who gets frustrated at all the unions that call strikes as a way of, of trying to resolve matters. But I'm also aware that unions play a vital role in ensuring that staff are treated justly and looked after ethically. And I really think that employers need to be held to account. And it was public, and it was unions, that held one employer to account in particular. Of not only how they were treating the staff, but how they were treating us. I want to show you an advert for a company I'm sure you've all heard of. So, don't dim the lights down. With a loan from Wonga.com, you'll decide the amount you want, how long you want it for, and we tell you exactly how much it'll cost. Up front, there is day. So there's no hidden charges or nasty surprises. No one likes nasty surprises. Oh, you know I hate trouble in this. Cash loans, you control. Wonga.com, straight talking money. Wonga.com, straight talking money. Aren't they going to look after you fantastically? They're going to tell you everything, straight talking money. Imagine I wanted to borrow a thousand pounds. Now, if I went to my bank and say they lent me the money at 7%, because I needed the money, and they lent me, that's about the going rate just now, 7% for a bank loan. But it goes wrong, because that's the problem. It goes wrong. And I can't pay the money back, so the, inter the interest builds up for three years. How much do I owe the bank? I'll tell you. Yeah, I owe the bank £70 for the first year, so it's 1070 Then it compounds up, so at the end of three years, I owe the bank £1,225. That's what I owe the bank. Imagine I borrowed that money from Wonga. Yeah? I borrowed the money from Wonga. I won't tell you at the peak what their interest rate was, but have a guess. I borrow the money from the bank, I owe £1,225. I borrow it from Wonga, £1,000 for three years. What do I owe? A couple of shout outs. 3000 8000 100000 Yeah, 100000 that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? No, it's £195 million. £195 million. Yes. £195,920,474. £195,920,474. Yes. At the highest rate, they were charging 5,808% per year. 
The no, due to unions and public outcry, brought it down to a mere 1,600%. Let me tell you, is that ethical? Do you think people understood that from that advert? No. No? It's okay if it goes right, if you borrow it for a week and pay back just an extra £15 for the week. But compound interest builds up. Let me tell you, if you're tight on money, payload lenders are not the way forward. Any of them. They are all in interested in self-interest. We need to look at other ways of handling money if we're tight on cash. And one other way is looking at CAP, Christians Against Poverty, which is an organisation, this is CAP Sunday. As a church, just this week, with the authority of, of the, the wardens, I, I've, I've agreed with the church that we're going to take on responsibility for employing with about another 12 churches in Southport to have a full-time CAP worker to, to help people with, with poverty in Southport. Uh, it used to be f uh, at Shoreline full-time, but Shoreline can't afford it. And the churches together are going to come together in order to help give advice to people that are tight on cash so they do not end up at longer. And I'm going to ask Dave Burton to go up on stage just for a few minutes and tell us a bit more about CAP and show us something interesting. Good morning, everyone. We're going to watch a short DVD in just a couple of minutes. But um, I was sat in a church in 2008 in Altrium. And John Kirby, who is the founder of CAP, uh, came to see us and to ask for money. Um, he was very clear. Uh, he said, we do three things. We help people who have got financial problems. We help people find work. And we tell them about Christ. And so every single week, nine people become debt-free through the work of CAP. And three people become Christians. And the video we're about to see just gives you a short um, next, it's about four minutes long of uh, three people who have had that help in the last year. And I know I stood here last year and quite a few people from the church signed up. So this is also a way of saying thank you to, your people, to you people that your money that you put in last year has had an impact. So thank you. Um, and I set up a sheet of addictions, uh, especially when I drink. Where the actual group was based was actually in a church, and yeah, I'll be honest, it might be the fact I knew that I'll probably have something to eat there and a drink that got me through the door. The guy that ran it was brilliant, and for three weeks we looked at all different topics like anger, um, forgiveness. And it worked, and it, and it did work for me. You know, since I found God, I don't, any situation that I, I go into now, I believe he's there. I mean, he's right, he's here right now. Before the release group, I was drinking pretty much every weekend. It was, so since the release group, yeah, not just drunk. I've been at work for a long period of time, and uh, I did it as a thought to everything. So we did this interview session, I had a real interview the following day. Every question that we'd gone over was uh, asked me again that day. And it was so, so easy, it was such a breeze, it was so relaxed. I believe that's one of the reasons that I got the job. And uh, most of the people that I started with are good friends, and uh, most of them have jobs. Since I've become uh, involved with CAP, I became a Christian, uh, which I didn't expect. So a fantastic Lord with his own time and a wonderful life. I went along to St John's and I met Emma and I remember walking, I remember walking through St John's church and there was an instant connection. I felt absolutely at peace. I was frightened because I knew I had so much paperwork and debt. I didn't know what to expect or where to begin, to be honest with you. And she sat me down and she was absolutely so, so kind and just made me feel at ease. And um, we started our journey. I remember actually helping me f with food as well that day because I had no food. The bankruptcy was all filed and filled out at head office, which is amazing. It was in two packs. 
and one was for me and one was for bankruptcy and then we went up to Emma and I went up to the court. It was amazing. Just you know, just the weight lifting and uh, today I'm full of the Holy Spirit and I do believe this is God's will and um, I feel that I've always had a hole in my soul all of my life, but it's been fulfilled now. So I feel I have peace of mind and I feel quite content. You know, and I'm really grateful, really, really grateful for Christians Against Poverty because without them, I wouldn't be here today. Clean, sober life. I don't smoke anymore. I have my family back. I have a contact with my mum and dad that I've never had. We, we get on, we laugh about so much stuff, there's no arguments. And I believe that had I not made the decision of contacting Cap, probably would never have got that. So thank you, Cap. Yeah, the cat job's brilliant. There's something for everybody that's out of work. And since I got a job within the first month, absolutely fantastic. New life, new leaf, all systems go. I'm a Christian and I love it. I'm a happy Christian. So thanks a lot out there, uh, all the other people at CAP. Since meeting Christians Against Poverty, I've found a faith which I'm truly grateful for. I'm debt free, I don't drink anymore. I've got my family back, I'm a nan. I worship every Sunday and I'm so happy to go forward for the rest of my life debt free and happy. And for that I'm truly grateful. Would you consider giving 12 pounds a month to Christians Against Poverty to change somebody's life like mine forever? Thank you. There. This year is the 20th anniversary of CAP. It started in 96, obviously 20 years on from there. And um, I can tell you this charity works. Um, I do nothing more than just give them some money each month. But every month I get an update, which is brilliant. Um, and it generally works. So if you know people, oh, just you someone who's just food, food, you need to help with that. Um, I don't work for CAP at all, as I say, I've just given them some money. Um, each month I've got some forms if you like to get a direct debit or a one-off donation or anything at all you like. It's not really the money that's the most important thing to my mind. The most important thing is people know that's there. It's Christians um, who do it professionally. They're very, very skilled in what they do and it works. And also they introduce people to Christ and you see the difference. Either side, you know, if you're somebody sat here this morning and in serious debt, don't go to Wonga, go to David. Yeah, go to Cap. Finally, we're looking at it's verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 says, You have lived on earth in luxury and self indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. This is probably the biggest area, definitely for, for me to focus on. And I imagine probably for most of us who are living lives in Southport. We're all aware, in fact, probably most of you are aware, you know, I'm, I'm not skint. I've run my own business for over a quarter of a century and it's, it's gone reasonably well. Which has left myself and Stella with a problem that we fought with all our lives. How generous should we be? How much should we spend? How much should we give away? Who should we give it away to? How much time should I devote to my business? How much time should I devote to, to serving God? How much time should I devote to earning money? How much time should I devote to working voluntary? You know, I've advised people on how to plan their finances for years. And not surprisingly, when I got ordained, I decided to, I had to do my thesis, I decided to do it on the teachings of Jesus on money because it was an area I was interested in. It was an area I wanted to really try and get sorted out. How to be unselfish, how not to, to see it as mine but see it as, as God's. And I, I could summarise 
my, my thesis was, you know what I'm doing now? It took me months and months and months and months to do it. But really, I could summarize it in two lines. What a waste of time that was then. Eh? <coughs> and the first line was, money tends to be sticky. It tends to stick in your pocket. It's a, it's a strange thing. You have to fight to give it away. That selfish gene lies quite close to the surface and definitely seems to surround your purse and wallet. And that gene needs to be crushed. Uh, and treating money with, I sometimes say, treat it with disrespect, giving it away without thinking it is sometimes great to do. Don't give it honour in that situation. But the second summary from my studies was that money tends, I use the word tends, money tends to separate us from God. To be clear on what I said there, money doesn't separate us from God. Money tends to, it has the potential to, it wants to. But the, the verse is often misquoted, which says money is the root of all evil, because it's not. You probably know it's the love of money, the love of money, which is the root of all evil. But when people have lots of money, they tend to love it. And so the, the love of money and money, you know, are very close together. We have to work really hard to make sure those of us who have money don't love it, but put it in its rightful place. But listen, I want this church to have loads of wealthy Christians. Just think what loads of wealthy Christians who have their pockets emptied continually on an ongoing basis can do for the furtherance of God's kingdom. John Wesley said this, earn a lot, save a lot, give a lot. It's not a bad summary that. You know, it's not a bad summary. Jesus calls money mammon because it wants to control, it wants to dominate, yeah, but it needs to be put in its place. But if you're somebody sat there today with money, which to be honest, living in Southport would be the vast majority of you, the question is, who controls it? How selfish are we? How much is it ours? How much is it not? Think of what that woman did, that unselfish act, when she came to worship Jesus and broke that bottle of perfume over his feet. And the disciples went loopy. That's a whole year's salary. Can you imagine if somebody next week came into this church and said, I've just spent £25,000 on flowers to put at the front of the church for next week because I want to worship God. What would our response be to that? Would it be, what a waste! What a waste! That was the disciples' response. But this woman put money in its rightful place. She used it to worship Christ. I have something of an issue with these massive churches. The amount of money it's spent on these glorious, uh, adorning, you know, like York Minster, you know. And I think, if they had a simple building, they could spend more money on the poor. And Jesus' confusing response is, the poor will always be with you. She did the right thing. And I, I struggle. I struggle with that. You know, and these churches perhaps are there to worship God, and if they're there, as a sign of adoration, a sign of respect, you know, of our worship and what we think of God, they can't be a bad thing. If they're there to show how wealthy the congregation are, they're a bad thing. We've got to get money put in its right place. So my summary of, of my thesis was this, all we have is ours to do with what God wants. All we have is ours. It's our money to do with what God wants if we're under God's authority, if we're putting wealth in the right place. You see, I'm not really interested, and you'll know this over the years, in the idea of tithing. I think tithing is good news for the rich. Imagine you've got Mary earning a million pounds a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she's a tither. 
So she gives away 100,000. And Mary, you have to cope with 900,000 a year. Yeah? Oh, we've got Jean on £10,000 a year. And she's a tither. And she gives away 1000 and has to live off £9,000 a year. That's fair. They're both tithing. Mary's free to do whatever she wants with her 900000 No. No. Tithing's mentioned twice in the New Testament by Jesus. Both times to ridicule the Pharisees. I believe tithing leads to, to guilt and hardship or even pride. It takes no account of capital. You know, your capital is totally separate. It nothing to do with You can do what you want with your capital. If your house grows massively or whatever, or you get inheritance, that's not income. It's capital. It's all mine. It's great. No, it's not. It's all you have to do with what God wants. That's the New Testament teaching. Acts teaches about koinonia. It's called having everything in common or the common pot. And when there's a need, the disciples came and they, they gave capital. And they collected income as well. And what is an offer that didn't give, they received. They were looked after. The only way I really I can relate to tithing, if you look at Israel, tithing was to look after the daily activities of the kingdom, look after the priests, look after the, the kingdom. And in some respects I see that with what we do in this church, is that there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a bottom line here. This church requires electricity, heating, lighting, expenses, etc. And as part of this fellowship, we should commit to that. That's a no-brainer. You know, that's maybe what you, you think about when it comes to tithing, but that's not koinonia. That's not all I have is God's. That's that, that comes into a legal system. You know, I really believe that if we take away the, the duty of the law and look at the love relationship of we sang about in these songs, where the whole realm of nature lies, that's an offering far too small. Yeah. When you start to think about that, when you think about what Christ did for us, we're no longer under law. We're no longer under duty. We're under love. I don't want to push this point too much. I do not believe in a doctrine that says if you give God money, he'll give you more money back. But I do believe that God's no man's debtor. And I do believe that when we give money, time, talents, that we will be better off. We will be better off. And that's, I really believe, you know, is the, is the conclusion of this. We need to offer our hearts over to God, as said in the Psalms as well, and our pockets, and our talents. And in offerings back to God, God will, will give back to us. It's interesting, and I think it's misquoted at um, sometimes, or the, the comparison not made. In Malachi chapter 4, God says this, Bring the whole offering into the, the tithe barn. And I will pour out so much blessing that you won't be able to cope with it. That's a slight paraphrase, but I will pour out so much blessing that you won't be able to cope with it. So, at that situation, God's saying, give me my tithe. And I will bless you so much that you'll have to build more barns. You won't cope with the blessing. But God doesn't demand the 10% anymore. If we bring that up to the 21st century, what does God require of us? He requires all. He requires everything. All to Jesus I surrender. But God says, give to me what's rightfully mine, and I will give you so much blessing that you won't be able to cope. Let's not focus on immoral wealth. Let's focus on righteous wealth at the disposal of Jesus Christ. Thank you. We're going to finish by singing one other song. It's a fantastic song. I'm going to ask the band to come to back up again. It's knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you. And these words are fantastic words. And the Psalms are saying, when you think about what it means to have Jesus Christ, and think what it does for us, it puts everything else into its right place. It gets the, 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 the process correct of our life and our worship. Knowing you, Jesus. We'll sing it together.